In our last episode, we talked about Gauguin forming his style in the summer of 1888 in Pontavon, with paintings like this vision after the sermon. We pointed out these two figures having their separate visions. Aren't these two blasphemous? What is the point of this painting? Was Gauguin glorifying these two? Since he was at least not critical of them, just which side was Gauguin on? Generally speaking, the development of art styles is always a strenuous undertaking. It is a process of realization of mental sensations on canvases or whatever other media that the artists use, through the adoption or invention of needed art techniques. We see that Gauguin made so much sacrifice, including his lifestyles and family, to chase those sensations and their realizations. He had to be looking for something the money and family failed to give to him. The first point here is that to understand a piece of art, one of the most effective shortcuts is to understand the mental state of the artist at the time. A bigger point is that despite all the problems in the Paris art market, which we are not going to get into, Paris was the place that made the best artists feel, at least, that they could express their sensations freely without any risk of causing any trouble for themselves. As nobody in Paris at the time, with the Voltaire spirit still hovering above, had the first inkling of pointing out the political incorrectness of artists. Let's call that the condition number one for art development. If there had been a force in France at that time, even if it were not dominant, to uphold some form of political correctness, we would not at least have seen so much lasting art from that period. These conditions are not static. They could change quickly. For instance, in our generation, Hong Kong used to be free and prosperous, much more so than Taiwan. Then the Taiwan people fought for their freedom and won. So Taiwan today is free and prosperous. On the contrary, Hong Kong people did not fight. After some one-sixth of population went to the street demanding freedom and democracy, and the government said no, a citywide strike should be the natural next move, Hong Kong people decided to do nothing. Now with all their elected parliament members either kicked out or forced out, freedom is a thing of the past. And so gone is their prosperity. To put this in another way, the constitutions of the Philippines and the United States are basically the same. But the fates of the two peoples are quite different. For instance, the Filipino court would not stand up when called upon, as it is not politically correct or convenient to do so. Justice is then the victim. Without justice, who is going to work unduly hard so they could be the next target and victim of injustice? The interesting fact here is that these politically correct and convenient countries could be sorry and poor forever. Just look at Cuba. But once it wants to overpower the free countries, like what the Soviet Union has attempted, it will self-inflict disasters. Just look at the collapsing economy of the militant and expensive China today. Remember the American academics praising the efficiency of the Chinese dictatorship? What impressed me in America is that people here somehow think that freedom is something they are born with, as if they could somehow practice socialism without losing it, especially when they themselves are the volunteer political correctness police. It seems to me that the ability to reason, something we gained in the 1600s and 1700s with a movement called the Enlightenment, is lost among those who have received college education. We call that in China, brainwashing. It is entirely possible for the Americans to lose their freedom in a generation or so. Then we either have to go through a bloody civil war to overthrow the ruling elite class, or the American people have to shut up and do what they're told forever. Interesting question here is whether America is going to be the next Hong Kong or Taiwan. The analysis is most definitely beyond the scope of this program. But the outcome will undoubtedly determine the future of art as art is one of those fields most sensitive to the activeness of the political correctness police. For now, let me just say that I'm optimistic about the future of America. 
In fact, like what I had said at the last episode of season one, I see a new birth of freedom. Back to our story of Gauguin. Remember those talented young artists like Emile Bernard, Paul Sarcosia, Edouard Villard, and Maurice Denis, whom Gauguin painted with in Pont-Aven. Gauguin, 40 years old now, became the mentor for these future artists half his age. The crowd was later called the Pont-Aven School. Let's take a look at some other painters of the Pont-Aven School. This is a painting by Bernard. We see flattened, simplified, and distorted figures. This one was by Villard. Look at the color simplification. This one was by Maurice Denis. We could compare these paintings with Gauguin's vision after the sermon. Which one do you think is the best? This is Serrosier's Le Bois de Mort à Pont-Avon. Bois de Mort, or Love Forest, was a picturesque forest with a lot of rocks along the river Lavant, not far from Pont-Avon. Serrosier wrote on the back of this canvas, made in October 1888 under the direction of Gauguin by P. Serrosier at Pont-Avon. He later told Denis how Gauguin told him to use pure colors to paint these scenes. The painting became the icon for the group known as Lena B. It is now known as the Talisman. Through these young, talented painters, as much as through his own paintings, Gauguin impacted the direction of the development of modern art. His advice to these young painters was, I quote, "Don't copy too much after nature. Art is an abstraction." Extract from nature while dreaming before it, and concentrate more on creating than the final result. End of quote. Dreaming before nature, then extracting from nature while concentrating on creating, were the essence of Gauguin's art making. Now we are coming close to understand why Gauguin was so attracted to art. Gauguin did the extracting by painting from memory. He was not the first painter to do that. In episode six, we mentioned that Goya painted from memory. After Gauguin, Pierre Bonnard, not to be confused with Emile Bernard, who painted with Gauguin in Pont-Aven and was a year younger than Bonnard, always painted from memory. Others, you know, including Degas, Matisse, and Picasso, also painted from memory. Cezanne, by working outside, was at the same time restricted by what was before him. Gauguin removed that restriction. Watch the next episode to find out what came of the idea. I'll see you then.